Let's look at a couple of additional examples of situations where we can create a sample space and use that to calculate probabilities. Let's go back to our spinner example that we were talking about in the last video, where we have a spinner that's equally broken up between four different colors, red, green, yellow, and blue. So in each of these, I'm going to spin this and I will end up with one of these four options. Now, for my event that I'm interested in looking at, I want to spin the spinner two times. And I'd like to be able to figure out some probabilities. In this case, it's pretty reasonable to figure out every possibility of ways or results that I can get when I spin the spinner twice. If I spin a red on this spinner first, then I could get any one of the three colors for my second spin. I could get a red followed by a red, a red followed by a green, a red followed by a yellow, or a red followed by a blue. Now, I might not spin a red the first time. What happens if I spin a green the first time? Well, I could, on the next set, get a green with a red, a green with a green, a green with a yellow, or a green with a blue. Now, I might not spin red or green first. Maybe I'd spin yellow first. Well, there's four options that time, too, when I go to do my second spin. If I spin yellow first, I can get red. I could spin yellow and then green, yellow and then a yellow again, or yellow and then blue. Or similarly, I could spin blue first and then get any of those options of red, green, yellow, or blue. So in this case, by spinning the spinner twice, I'm able to write out every possibility of options that I could get. And it's equally likely that I would get any one of these results because all of my spacing on the spinner is equal. So as long as I have a nice equally weighted spinner, then it will be random and I'll get one of these, one of these options. How many options are there? Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, oops, yellow, 13, 14, 15, 16. So there's 16 equally likely outcomes, and so 16 is going to end up being the bottom number in any probabilities that I want to calculate. Let's suppose that I'm interested in finding the probability that I spin a green first. Again, my event, I'm spinning the spinner twice, and I'm looking at the outcome of getting a green first. Well, I know there's 16 equally likely possibilities from spinning a spinner twice, and then I just want to look at how many ones have green first. This one, this one, this one, and this one. Green, then red, green, then green, green, then yellow, green, then blue. There's four different options out of those 16. I can divide those on my calculator and get 0.25, or a 25% chance that the first spin is going to be green where the second spin doesn't have any sort of other type of a restriction. Now, let's look at the probability of getting a red on one of our spins, so getting at least one red. In this case, the red could be in the first spin or the red could be in the second spin. Because it has the word at least, the, could, we can also include the situations where red gets spun both times. In this case, there are a total of 16 options. The chance of getting at least one red is going to be, I have red and red, red and green, red and yellow, red and blue. So anytime I spin the red first, it works. Or anytime I spin the red second, it's going to get counted. So the green and then red, the yellow and then red, and the blue and then red. Notice here that there's a total of seven different options of ways that I can get at least one red in my result. Red could be on the first spin, red could be on the second spin, um, but we don't want to double count the one where red is the, both the first and the second spin. Again, I can divide these, and in this case, I can get 0.4375 or a 43.75% chance. 
that I will at least get one red in two spins. Now, what would be the probability of getting exactly one red? Again, we're looking at a slightly different situation here. Exactly one red means I can't count the red and red this time because that has two reds in it. All these other options, the other six options, all only had exactly one red. So six out of 16. Um, which would give me, excuse me, 0.375 or a 37.5% chance of that happening. Again, for showing your work, I'm interested in your unreduced fraction where you're using the total options and the equivalent percentage probability. Let's consider a couple of other things that we might look at here. Let's suppose that we want to find what is the probability of not getting a red? There's two ways that we can find this. We can either look at the probability of not getting a red and just count anything that does not have a red in my list out of the 16. So up here, that has a red, that has a red, that has a red, that has a red. So none of those. Not getting a red, I could do green, 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 yellow, green, blue, yellow, green, yellow, 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 blue, blue, green, blue, yellow, blue, blue, and I end up with a total of nine different ways that that could happen. Now, if you notice, the ways of not getting a red is the same as looking at all of the ways except the ones of getting at least one red. So in this case, we had 100%, and we can subtract the probability of getting at least one red because it either has at least one red or we don't have any at all. So 100% minus the 7 over 16. Is going to get us 7 divided by 16. Oh. Excuse me. Is 43.75. Oh, I have that right there. So 100% minus 43.75% is equal to 56.25%. Or just directly counting all of the ones that don't have reds. If I do 9 divided by 16, I also get 0.5625 or 56.25%. So the opposite of not having any is having at least one. And knowing that relationship that we can balance out if we know one of these, we can figure out the other one by subtracting that from 100% because these end up being mutually exclusive as we go through. What would be the probability of getting both the same color? Same concept here. If I have a total of 16 different options, that becomes my bottom number. And then I can count anything where the colors are exactly the same. So the red and red, green and green, yellow, yellow, blue, blue. There's four ways that that could happen. Or 25% or out of 16. Now, let's consider two other situations here and see how they're different. What is going to be the probability of spinning a red, then a green, versus the probability of spilling, spinning a red and a green together, or a red and then and a green, excuse me. Order matters when we're talking about probability. 
If I'm looking at the probability of doing red and then green, there's only one way that that can happen from our list, right? RG. One out of my 16 processes that will work for that. And 1 over 16 gives me 0 0.0625, or a 6.25% chance that that will happen. Now, if all I care about is where I end up on the twister board, right, it doesn't matter if the red comes first and the green comes first. If I just want to make sure that I have a red and a green result, I could either get a red-green or I could get a green-red. Either of these possibilities is going to work. A red-green option, there's 1 out of 16 or 6.25% chance. For a green and then a red, that just shows up once in my equally likely list there as well. So a 1 and then 16, which is a 6.25% chance. When I see that keyword or in a problem, it's a good clue here that we are going to need to add what those results are together. So here, if a red green or a green red would both fulfill those possibilities, then I can take my 6.25% plus the 6.25% from getting the green first and get 12.5% probability here that it's going to be this case or this case from my list. So do pay attention if there is an order described. If there's not an order described, then we just need both of these results. Um, and it, either order would be able to work in that instance.